Solaccio. Clarice. Solici. It was our speaker. We, we've had him, I think, five times. The last time he spoke on the marathon mile by mile. And as you all know, he's a, a historian of the marathon, an expert on it. Um, he also has a long history with running marathons. He's the race director for the Camry and the David races. Right down the road. <laughs> here in Walpole. Um, he, he used to be the editor, the sports editor, and the editor of the Walpole Times um, years ago. And he has written several books and has done a lot of speaking on the marathon. So tonight we're, we're pleased to have him speak on his new book, Boston Marathon Traditions and More. And uh, please, you, you, you can ask questions as, you, as he goes along. Yeah, just raise your hand while I'm talking. Well, you have to wait. And, mm -hmm. and he does have his books with him, so at the end, if you'd like to purchase one, you can. So please join me in a warm welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'll take you through a little bit of the, some of the traditions. The, the book on the far these are my two most recent books. The one on the uh, left has more of the overall history of the race people. The one that uh, just came out a couple weeks ago, Traditions and Lore. I had found that during my other uh, talks on the Boston Marathon, a lot of the questions people wanted to know more about a few of the traditions that have really um, focused on Boston. And so I picked about a half a dozen or so for this book, uh, the most recent one. Uh, but I can talk about other things too throughout the whole race. So if you have questions that may trigger you about running it or training it or something on the course that maybe I hadn't addressed, bring it up. I, I don't mind at all. Um, a quick history as a baseline for this, the uh, 1896 Modern Olympic Games in Greece um, was uh, the first Modern Olympic Games. And part of the U.S. Olympic team was comprised of some BAA members, Boston Athletic Association. Uh, organized with the Boston Marathon. Uh, the BAA had just formed a few years earlier. Um, so the athletes did pretty well in, in the Olympics and winning uh, some of the events. One of the event was the marathon, which was only about 24, 25 miles at the time. Uh, it's actually only the third marathon. Boston's really the fourth. The first marathon, if you disregard the mythological fidibities, uh, the first real marathon was the qualifier in Greece in 1896. The second marathon was the marathon in the 1896 Olympics. Third marathon was one from uh, Connecticut to New York. It was just a one-shot deal uh, in late 1896. And the fourth marathon was Boston in 1897. And um, so they came back with this idea of the marathon because at the time, the BAA had an event of the BAA games. There was, a, there was a, a track behind the Boston Public Library, which is no longer there that had a couple of events. They thought the marathon would be great to end our BAA games. It could finish on the track. So we'll just measure 24, 25 miles, which became Ashland, um, until it increased to 26.2 miles, and then it became Hockington. Um, so that's a quick synopsis of a connection between Boston and Greece, which is important with some of these traditions. Um, the first tradition I want to really talk to about that's really specific to Boston, and even though uh, some other races do this, is the laurel wreath. Um, this is the laurel, you can tell the difference between a laurel wreath and the olive branch wreath. The laurel wreath has bigger leaves than the laurel branch. Uh, the olive branch wreath is what you can do now, a little thinner. Um, the connection with this is that uh, in the time of Zeus in Greece, people worshipped him in his area where he lived um, were laurel and olive trees. So they were considered sacred. And at the 490 Battle um, of Marathon, when the Athenians beat the Persians, basically securing our world of democracy that we know now, um, there's a big tomb, the big mound called the Tomb of the Athenians, where the soldiers were died and buried. And around the Tomb of the Athenians are olive trees. And from that is the branches that are used for the wreaths. Um, so some of the Olympic Games, uh, they've been awarded the winners, Boston for decades, some of the other races. Um, it's not really mandated for the Olympics, surprisingly. Only four Olympic Games have presented it. Uh, I contacted the Olympic committees and they say, no, it's up to each city. But Boston has really um, embraced this connection between Greece and Boston. So that's an early version of those early photos that you see a lot of the runners getting. They're much bigger uh, and more full. Uh, this is a photo from 1946. The runner is... Uh, Kyriakidis, Stelianos Kyriakidis from Greece, who won in 1946. And this gentleman here, George Demeter, who's holding a wreath, 
Uh, he's our first Greek American representative in the State House. He wrote about parliamentary law. Uh, he's really proud of his Greek heritage. Uh, he sponsored Kyriakides. Uh, he was really underweight. Um, Kyriakides was. This is 1946 after the war, so Greece was really decimated. Um, Kyriakides actually used this win to promote uh, needing help for Greece. So a lot of supplies, money, funding, clothing. Based on this, he kind of went around the country. He was like literally a couple of boatloads of supplies went to Greece because of this. He's like our first charity winner, so to speak. Um, but Demeter really wanted to continue that connection between Boston and Greece. So he fashioned, he had these wreaths fashioned in Greece around the tomb of the Athenians with the branches, and they were flown to Boston. Uh, no big ceremony yet. Uh, he started this in 1931. Did it for, he did it personally for about 20 years or so. Uh, if you ever see some of the old footage, um, I mean, he's dressed really nicely with a suit and tie, and then after the, the winner crossed the finish line, you see him chasing after the guy with the wreath, which is kind of funny. It's like, you know, they'll stop. You can wait, but he's all excited. So uh, he started this, this connection, um, which still lasts today, which is great that he did that. Um, in the mid-70s, this is Bill Rogers, who won Boston four times. This is his wreath from 1975. He doesn't know what the other ones are. <laughs> uh, he goes, it was different back then. Um, this is a shadow box that he had in his store at Faneuil Hall. It's a little bigger, so it must be a laurel wreath. Uh, 70s and 80s sort of went from laurel to uh, the olive branch. Uh, the, tr the tradition never wavered, but it was kind of tough sometimes getting some of these wreaths uh, created. Um, but it wasn't until um, the late 70s and 80s when the marathon really started to advance with popularity, organization, funding, things like that, that really focus on some of these traditions. Um, this is what it looks like now. This is the olive branch. You can see it's a little thinner. Um, the first few were green, obviously, like, like the uh, laurel wreath. Uh, in 2010 was the first year it was gold dipped. That marked the 2,500th anniversary of the Battle of Marathon. And then in 2014, it was gold dipped, the first anniversary after the bombings. Um, and Meb Kofleski, who won, didn't realize that. So when he because he had always seen the previous years, it was green, so when he won and they put the gold, he was like, wow, this is beautiful. It, it, it has some weight to it. it was really, he, was, he was touched and surprised. Um, but now it's gold dipped. And what they do now is they have a really big ceremony. Um, that, as I say, they're fashioned from the, around the tomb of the Athenians, flown here, and then what they do is they have a really nice big ceremony either in the State House at the Great Hall um, or in the Greek consulate usually the Thursday before the Boston Marathon. Um, and they present them, the dignitaries there, his Governor Dukakis right here, um, proud Greek American, as we always know from his presidential campaign, uh, <laughs> when he always said that. But for years, he presented the wreath. He was really proud of that, because the governor and the mayor are the ones who present, still do, uh, the wreath. So he was really uh, proud of that. So they either have it here uh, in the Great Hall, or more recently inside the, the Greek consulate, which is just down the road on Beacon Street. Uh, you can see them on the far left of the podium, they're on the table. So they present it. They have uh, the dignitaries from both countries uh, and both organizations. Um, it's a really nice formal presentation. Um, and then those are the wreaths that you see um, on TV being presented. Uh, this is last year. Governor Healy is presenting um, to the men's winner. She was governor for maybe three months at this point. Um, and I remember interviewing her like right after this at the finish line. And um, th this connection was not lost on her, because I was telling her a little bit about the deeper history of this, of the wreath with Boston. And she goes, I didn't know it was that deep. She goes, but I do get that connection, being a politician, being a governor, the democracy that the Athenians secured by you know, being the Persians. She goes, I, I do get that. She goes, I'm really honored to have that. So she, the history's not lost on her. A lot of people know that. Um, <coughs> and Mayor Wu, the mayor, gives it to the female. Uh, winner and the wheelchair athletes you see as well. So it's right on the finish line when you see it. So the connection is very, very deep. Uh, again, other races do it. I think New York does it. Chicago might. They may not get, I mean, they're honoring that tradition, but they may not get how deep that is to Greece and democracy and the, the world that we know it. Um, but it's nice that they keep doing it. So then when Boston has ceremonies like this, it reminds people, they, they talk about it. Uh, I remember talking to the Greek consulate for the books, and he was saying, you know, don't get us Greeks talking about history, we'll just talk forever. <laughs> Which, as a writer, I didn't mind. <laughs> so that was nice of them. 
Um, this is a great old photo from the uh, Ashland Historical Society, 1912. Uh, talk about the tradition of the starting lines, uh, start and finish, which isn't unique to Boston. But what they do is, um, this is probably no starting line <laughs> because of the mud. Uh, if you've run Boston or watched it on TV, the start, there's been three different starting lines in Ashland. The first two years was on Pleasant Street. I'll show you a photo of that later. Uh, the next several years was about half a mile or so behind it on the, on the bridge that goes over the Amtrak tracks. And the third and final time it was in Ashland was here, which is actually uh, 135, the current four kilometer mark. So when runners run over the four kilometer mark area of the Boston Marathon, they're running over the last time it was in Ashland. Um, in 1908 Olympics in London, the royal family wanted to see the start at Windsor Castle and the finish in front of the royal box is a track. In order to do that, they had to extend the marathon a mile and whatever it is to make it 26.2 miles and then that became the universal distance. And so when that happened, um, <coughs> for the 20, 1924 Boston, they just measured whatever the distance was and it became Hopkinton. If Ashland was bigger at the time, it would still be in Ashland. Um, Frank Shorter, our Olympic gold and silver medalist marathon, always says when he crosses the 24, 25 mile mark, he always curses the Royals. He goes, I'd be done now. <laughs> I gotta run another mile, great. Um, so it's just interesting to show no starting line. I mean, back then, I was talking to someone earlier, it wasn't until the late 60s that there were 1,000 runners for the Boston Marathon. All those decades before, it was hundreds, 200, 300, not too many. Um, just enough to make like a smaller race. So the, the start line and finish line was basically like this, this little white line, which was fine. That's all you needed. Um, this photo is from 1966 in front of the Prudential Center. From 1965 to 1985, if you remember, this is Ring Road, which is parallel to Boylston Street. So for those 21 years, when runners came on uh, Boylston Street, after about a block or two, you veered off Boylston Street and ran Ring Road. Again, Boylston Street's like right here. So all those Bill Rogers, Joan Blanc Samuelson, Bob Hall wins that you see the photos, it's there in front of the Prudential Center. And they did that to about 1985, and 1986 was the first year of the sponsorship of John Hancock. So John Hancock basically said in late 1985, you know, here's a $10 million check for 10 years, uh, don't cash it until you move the finish line from in front of our competitor to closer to the Hancock Tower. <laughs> so the BA goes, uh, okay, <laughs> that's why it changed. Um, this is all like a cement patio now, if you've been in the Peru area, you wouldn't even know. Um, there is a real ring road that cuts to the Western Hotel, but this is, this is like an offshoot of it. But it goes, the, the example I'm using is what the starting line looked like until 1981. Uh, this is the starting line in Hawkington. Um, 1981 to mark the 50th anniversary of Johnny Kelly, Johnny the Elder Kelly from the Cape, uh, who had won Boston twice, came in second seven times, Ran till the day he died at 97 years of age, uh, a legend. Um, they won a, a nice big banner or something in front of the building. So Jack LaDuke, local guy, uh, was contacting me. We created a real nice anniversary, big poster kind of thing that they put in front of the building. Uh, but then he noticed for the start and finish was just like a white line. He goes, you know, the world comes here. We should make something. Do, let's do something, make it a little better. I'm artistic, I can do something. So in 1981, he did this, it was green, this is the actual photo, the green and white, BAA, Hawkington, he just kind of dressed it up a little bit, and for years he did the start and finish. Um, he just retired recently from doing it, a couple of years ago. So <laughs> over the years, it kind of grew and grew and grew. Um, in 1996, for the hundredth, you can see, it grew, yeah, much more. Jack is the gentleman standing on the left with the blue vest. Um, from the, the width of it, from here to here, is 100 inches. It grew to 106 inches for the 106th anniversary. And then he goes, you know, I'm kind of running out of paint. I gotta bring this thing back a little bit. He's getting all excited. Um, but he would, do, he would paint it beautifully, this and the finish line for a number of years. Then he, then he just did the starting line. But very unique to Boston. Um, I've run Boston 23 times and I've run 20 other marathons. And I can't recall any other marathons having other than just a line. Really, I can't really recall any attention to the start and finish line that we do in Boston. So for the 100th, he had like an old English lettering, um, 06 or 08, I can't remember the year, when we had wave starts for the first year. You know, for decades at noon, gun went off, everybody went. Then what they did is they did 
like two different starts. Now there's like nine starts, I think. But when they first introduced wave starts, which is like a thousand runners every two minutes, kind of spread it out a little bit. He painted waves on the starting line. Um, one of the anniversaries, the Dave McGilvey, the race director, um, he runs it every year after everybody. Like the 40 or 45th anniversary, he had like a little insignia with this thing. He always does something different. Never tells anyone. It's really neat what he does, the attention. Um, this one is beautiful. This is the, the start line from 2005. Johnny Kelly died in 2004 in the fall. So the first Boston without him, this is what Jack did. Didn't tell him. Real beautiful stencil of Johnny with the logo. So it was a real, every year it was something different, different colors. If it were reflected in the anniversary or something, really nice. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing the, the work that he did. Um, the finish line itself, over the years, more recently marathons do, they kind of unroll uh, this 3M uh, laminated finish line. Um, and then after it's over, they peel it off, throw it away. But what Boston does, I don't know if anyone else does this either, Dave McGilvery says, I think I'm, we're the only marathon who paints the finish line after the race, <laughs> <laughs> which is true. So Monday night when they peel the finish line off and throw it away, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, depending on the weather, they block off Boylston Street. I did a story on this, it was cool. And they paint it. So tourism and stuff can take pictures for, throughout the year. That's the only reason they do it. Um, it was great doing this too, because I was able to park on Boylston Street like at 3 a.m because they blocked it off. That was, that was kind of fun. Um, but it's neat seeing the finish line totally yellow at one point, because they put the base on just totally yellow. Um, then they had stencil it, make it 3D. Um, uh, so what you see for the remaining of the year, up until the next Boston, that's what you see. Uh, and it's so pronounced. Here it is, you can see like the 3D images, like the white edges around <laughs> it. Um, I took this from the 54th floor of the Hancock one year. And you can see it. I don't know if you can see it from space, <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it's amazing. This is the library right here uh, to give you a sense of where you are. Um, and that's why they do it. So it's amazing. I really can't think of any other races that do this. There could be, but we really do details and really kind of make it nice to start and finish. Something really neat. Ah, the coveted medals, right? Another great tradition. Um, in the old days, the, the medals in the top left corner, I can't reach you from there. Um, just the winners would get it. And there'd be a little diamond in the middle, uh, the top left corners there, and that was it. Um, nothing else, you know, no finisher medals, nothing like that. Um, Ashworth Awards in North Attleboro made these. Uh, the two on the um, far left there are the course record medals. There's a little uh, um, jewel that you see above the unicorn. Then you have the male female, open male female wheelchair with a diamond here. Beautiful, beautiful medals. Uh, and that's all they did. And then in the mid-80s, um, other marathons started to come up. Chicago, or late 70s, mid-80s, New York. And by that time, attitudes were changing a little bit with runners. Uh, they wanted some more swag. Um, so those marathons offered medals to finishers, uh, t-shirts, things like that. The BEA is like, well, you know, back then, people run Boston because it's Boston. True, but there are other things. Uh, they finally came around, so they contacted Ashworth in 1983. This is the first finisher medal, started in 1983. That's what it looked like, nice round pewter thing, no color, had the unicorn logo. Um, so that's the first one, 1983, that every finisher got this, and without a ribbon, didn't come with a ribbon <laughs> back then. Um, so it was neat that they started it. Um, it's changed over the years. I've inter I interviewed Dan Ashworth, the president. He goes, we try to keep the elements the same, uh, we try to update it a little bit here and there. Um, this is the assembly line where they had like a little horseshoe design that they, they pumped them out. Uh, they're very proud of doing that because they do all the awards. Yes? Why the unicorn? Uh, the unicorn, there's no real concrete reason. The unicorn's a logo of the BAA. And there's like two or three stories. One is that the daughter of one <coughs> of the members liked unicorns back in the 18, late 1880s. Uh, one was the, when they were trying to find a logo, here's something that's really intangible that you can reach for, but it's not, you can't really attain it, but it's there. Um, Dan Asher was telling me the story he heard was also, there was a cigar shop, um, this is more pragmatic, and there was like a little, a unicorn cigar lighter, and they would flick the nose or something and the flame would come out the horn, and the BA members would light their cigars with that, and that's in the BAA, um, memorabilia right now. So 
pick whichever one you want. <laughs> John Hanf wrote a book about the BAA and did a lot of research. Unfortunately, the old records and everything have been destroyed. There was a BAA clubhouse behind the library, Boston Public Library. They lost it with some, you know, it was the Great Depression, bad deals, whatever. And then the records were all lost. So if it was written down somewhere, it's one of those things that you never knew. It looks awesome. I like it. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just one of those things no one really has a concrete answer. Which I think adds to it, right? <laughs> the, myth, the mythology of it. Yeah. Uh, so these are examples of just to finish your medal with the 1983 one right there. Um, so the next year to the left of it, it still stayed pewter, but then they had the little horseshoe on it with a, a, a horizontal uh, base. Then they started introducing different colors, different enamel. Then they had hollow on each side of the unicorn. I think the new one, um, Bank of uh, America is the new sponsor after the 30 something years of Hancock. I think this is like a white enamel here. It says Bank of America, but it, it kind of kept this and everything. So it's, it's changed over the years. So these are great examples that Ashworth gave me of how it's looked. I think the largest one, the top left, um, like with the starting line, they, they, they just kept growing because it was just, they just got uh, excited. <laughs> and they go, oh, wait a second, we got to kind of reduce it a little bit. It's still a good size, it's still big, but it's kind of neat to see how it started, very small to something like that. But they kind of keep the same elements on it. But that's how it started, it just something like that, very innocuous, 1983 or the finishing medal um, that everybody wants. Uh, this tradition is very unique to Boston. Um, this is Keizo Yamada, the Japanese winner who won in 1953, being congratulated by John Hines, the mayor. Um, Hines Auditorium is named after uh, John Hines. Um, this is Exeter Street. That street that you see cutting across, that's Boylston. Kind of give you a sense, there's the Lennox on the left, BA Clubhouse. Just kind of give you how it looked back then. Um, Boston Marathon was very welcoming to Japanese runners after the war. And they did very well, Keizo won. Uh, Keizo Yamada kept winning his age group too as he got older. He was an excellent runner. Um, and to thank Boston, in the mid 70s, um, there's a city outside Tokyo, Omi. O H M E, or O M E is the city. Uh, the Omi Ochi 30 kilometer race contacted the BAA and said, why don't we do like a sister agreement, a sister city thing where we can exchange athletes and cultures, something we can do just to, to keep this kind of like a, a nice official, unofficial relationship. So for the 1975 Boston Marathon, what they did is the top two Americans of the Boston Marathon will be invited to run the Omiochi 30K, which was in February and March, depending on the year. Top two at Omiochi would come to Boston, and they'd bring representatives with them. They'd exchange cultures, educational programs, go to theaters. Um, it, it was really neat what they did. Bill Rogers and Tom Fleming were the first two Americans, and they, uh, they won a couple of the uh, races, too. Um, so every five years, they'd have an agreement that they signed. Still do this. It's, it's, it's really unique um, of what they do. Great recognition. Uh, this is 2015. Joanne Flaminio, the BA president at the time with the OMI mayor, uh, this is in Boston, signing the five-year agreement. Um, this is the last one they've done. This is 2015, so the next five years would have been COVID. So they didn't have that, obviously. So I think they're going to wait till next year to make it 10 years. But they're still doing it. And they've also opened it up over the years to not just the first two finishers. Um, they've opened up to other dignitaries, other runners. Um, I think last year, a year before, they had a Hopkinton and Ashland High School student uh, go over there and run, I think they have a 10K, which had to have been amazing for a kid to do that. Um, so they go back and forth and they continue it. They exchange gifts, they, they exchange uh, educational programs. This is 2015. Gloria Ratty on the far left, she, she recently passed away. She's really maintained the history of this race. She's been collecting a lot of the awards. That display of medals that I showed you earlier, she collect, she's just been always looking around just to kind of regain some of the stuff that's been lost over the decades. Uh, I really miss her, she did a great job. So you get like the, the, the um, leaders of Boston and the Omi Oji race came here. Um, and it's really neat when they exchange the gifts one of the things that, that, that um, they do from Omi is this beautiful ceramic with birds uh, from the area and stuff with the awards and trophies. It's just a real nice ceremony to keep doing that. And they've been doing it since the mid-70s. This is very unique to Boston. I don't think any other marathon really has this kind of a connection. 
um, much like with the Greek connection that we have. So it's really neat that we continue something like that. It's not just a race. You know, it's really something uh, deeper than that. Um, if you've run the race, you know what this is, the village, another tradition of ours. Um, most every marathon I can think of has an athlete's village, but we didn't for the longest time. Um, for the most part, for years, you could just marathon morning, go up to Hopkinton, get your number, and run. <laughs> uh, those days are over. Um, for the 100th in 1996, there was 38,000 runners. They knew this was going to be a huge event, but they had, we're going to put out 38,000 runners. So they created the athletes' village, there's two of them, but for the regular athletes um, who aren't going to win, they created this. This is the field behind the high school and the middle school um, in Hopkinton, the entrance that you just saw. Um, this is seven tenths of a mile from here to the start uh, on Main Street. So everyone is here, like I say, in the old days at noon, everyone would go, so they would make an announcement and like, everyone would go. But now you, they make announcements per corral. It's a little easier, they spread out the, uh, the race. Um, and if you remember 1996, a day or two, maybe two or three days before the marathon, it snowed out. Um, that's Boston, right? I mean, that's the New England weather. We've had snow for, for Boston, uh, rain, hurricane, rain, uh, solar eclipse, uh, 50 degrees, 30, it's, it have everything, 90 degrees, um, it, it, we run the gamut. So it snowed, so Dave McGilvey, the race director, had to kind of quickly think what to do. So he cleared off most, best that he could, but then what he did to really accelerate it is he had a couple of army helicopters hovering about 100 feet above the grass to kind of dry it off, which really, it worked. Um, I, always, I do always joke with him, I said, I hope he told the neighbors <laughs> about that. Um, I live in Walpole, and with the Noah Airport, if anyone's local around here, the army helicopters go from Noah to like Mansfield or something. They're like 1,000 feet up, and they, they rattle the windows. Can you imagine 100 feet up you know, being a neighbor? Um, I, I ran this year, too. I ran from 1990 to 2012, so this was one of them. Um, and it, it wasn't that bad. I mean, it was a little muddy, but he put sawdust and straw. It, it worked. It wasn't too bad for, for what he had to do. Um, I don't know how he thought of that. Uh, this is the Fairmont Copley, the host hotel in Boston. Um, behind this is, it used to be the John Hancock Conference Center. It's no longer there. I forget what, it is, what replaced it. But right behind this was that conference center. And in the late 80s, that began where the Elite Athletes Village was, which is now in here. The Elite Athletes Village is 30 or 40 elite athletes that the John Hancock invites. They're Olympians, top marathoners, uh, up and coming. It's, it's the guys and women that you see and the wheelchair athletes in front of these races. So for two weeks, like three floors of the old building was their village. They come here a couple weeks ahead of time. Everything they need there, international food, because we're all from different countries. Um, any kind of scheduling, any airport pickups. Uh, it's amazing the, the organization that they have. This is what was called the boiler room in the old place. Everything went through here. Um, the different water bottles that they have, the fluids that you see on the tables uh, on TV, uh, it, there's water tables and Gatorade tables, but then there's also the elite athletes have tables along the course with their fluids that they put themselves. Um, if you really pay attention on the coverage, you'll see like little flags sticking out or colored tape. So then as the athlete is coming closer, they can kind of see where their bottle is and they'll grab it. That goes through here too. Um, anything that they need, if they're going to a sponsored event, a press conference, training, shopping, goes through here. Uh, in all this big area. Um, it, it's amazing what they did. It's, it's like three floors. It's secluded, very secure. Uh, Fred Tressler right here and Tim Kilduff um, created it in the late 80s. Uh, he's showing all the passes. I mean, it's really <laughs> excellent. Um, when they tore that building down, the Elite Athletes Village went into the Fairmont Cloppy, uh, the big building I showed you earlier. Same kind of, I mean, they didn't bring everything over, but they have a couple of floors there, basically the same kind of setup in that hotel um, that they have. So it, it's really, it's unbelievable. I was, talk, elite, I was interviewing some of the elite athletes for the book, and they said, Boston spoils us. He goes, I'll do other marathons, and I got to take a cab from the airport to the hotel. <laughs> he goes, we are spoiled in Boston. This is great. Anything we need, the massages, anything is here. Um, so that's, that is very unique to us, which is great. Um, media coverage, too, has grown, um, especially with Boston because the world has come here for, for decades. Um, in the old days, I'll show you some progression. That's Les Pawson on the left, who's won Boston 
few times. Um, there was a time, like I said, it wasn't until the late 60s that it reached 1,000 runners. Prior to that, it was dozens or hundreds. So you could just grab them, get some pictures, get an interview. Um, I was talking to a couple of people from the Globe and the Herald in the 70s and 80s, the Greater Boston Track Club, um, who Bill Squires coached, started in 1973. All the American winners basically in the 70s and 80s came out of the Greater Boston Track Club. Bill Rogers, uh, Beryl Salazar, Greg Meyer, Bob Hall, the wheelchair athlete, were Greater Boston Track Club members. And they hung out, like most everybody, at the Elliott Lounge, which is no longer there. It was in the Elliott Hotel about a mile before the finish line. It was like a runner's lo lounge is, is painting it uh, <laughs> elegantly. It was a bar. It was a runner's bar. Tommy Leonard, the late Tommy Leonard, who starred the Falmouth Road Race, was the bartender. He'd have national anthems of all the different countries. He'd have all the flags, running photos. They had the high jump record painted on the wall. The long jump record was painted. It was a great runner's mecca. Everybody went there. Um, even when they interviewed the athletes, what are you going to do? It wasn't Disney World, like Bill Rogers and Bill Lee, the Red Sox guy. Pitcher even said, yeah, I'm going to the Elliott. <laughs> it was just the place to go. So the reporters, if they wanted to do stories throughout the year or that weekend, they went to the Elliott Lounge, sat at the bar, interviewed them. It was that close connection that you could just do it back then. They didn't need big press conferences. So that's what they did. Um, this is the mid-50s. You get the top three runners. A couple of pictures on a, on a little bed, and the reporters are waiting for questions. That, that's, it is what it was. It just, that's what they needed. Um, they didn't have these huge press conferences because they didn't really need it. But then, <laughs> um, I don't know if you remember the TV wars, like Channel 4, 5, and 7 would battle over ratings. They still kind of do. But when all three stations, and then Channel 25, and then the international media, uh, I mean, it's grown that the Boston Marathon is second only to the Super Bowl as far as media the amount of media who come to this event. It's amazing. Um, so when this started to happen, and the running boom in the late 70s, um, the qualifying standard that was supposed to reduce the runners that didn't reduce the runners, uh, more and more runners wanted to run. It just grew and grew and grew. So did the media coverage from towns and states and countries. So th what they had to do was organize big press conferences, just because you had to. This is the Fairmont Copley, one of the ballrooms. These are all media. This is a press conference. <laughs> There's a bunch of them like this. I attend them. Um, on the stage in the far right is Carrie Tolson, one of our US Olympians. And she's interviewing, at the beginning of the, this press conference, the, she's interviewing the top five women. Um, I think the uh, open in the wheelchair. Then the men would come out just to kind of get it going. And then what they would do is these tables around, there were tables around the ballroom with nameplates. And the 30 or 40 lead athletes would go to their table. And then for the next couple hours, the media would just, it was like a free-for-all. And it was great because the athletes knew once this was done, we're not going to be accosted on the sidewalk. We're not going to get phone calls. You know, we're doing our job as a runner to take care of the media. All those stories that you see that week, the weekend in the paper, on TV, is basically done here on Saturday. Friday and Saturday, there's a couple of them. And it's good. It gives the athletes time to rest. They're like, okay, I'm done with this, this commitment, now I can do something else. So they had these huge press conferences. Again, you need it now with the thousands of runners, averaging 30. Um, in the old days, you didn't. This is kind of neat. This is race day. So when you're at home watching TV or on, on the course itself, this is the media. It's a different ballroom at the Fairmont. And the room's double the size that I focused on the TV monitors. Um, the media is just lined up watching it. They have all the races. They have the men's uh, f uh, from left to right, the men's wheelchair, women's wheelchair, women's open, men's open, the timing, the splits, everything is right here. So if they're doing any kind of live coverage or blogging or daily reporting, uh, weekly newspapers, whatever it is that you read about and see, this is where it is. And then after they win, um, they have a couple of questions at the finish line, but then they come right here. And there's a little side area on the left that the media can interview them, and then there's like the formal press conference. So they really try to accommodate, because also there's different countries covering this, you know, and it, it could be tomorrow <laughs> from a country reporter, you know, who's from New Zealand, who's already tomorrow, they need to do that coverage right now. So th they do accommodate, they, you can interview them then, later on in the evening. It's a nice way that they, they um, do have this all set up and organized. Again, you didn't have to do this early on, but uh, you really have to now. Um, and this photo I love, this is Jordan Hasse, one of our great runners. 
uh, a few years ago. She's coming in third place, and you get this wall of photographers. It just shows the difference between the first photo I showed you, one guy taking a picture of Les Paulson on the, on the front yard somewhere, to this, which is awesome. And she's coming in third, not even winning. And she has this attention, the world's media. Um, she goes over here. She doesn't have to jump over everybody. <laughs> the an entrance right here. Um, but that shows you the progress. It shows you the accommodations. It showed you all, all the media attention, men and women, wheelchair athletes, open. Uh, this is right at the finish line. So it, it's just, it's, you see that progression, which w is needed. Uh, yes? Is there some kind of bleachers there just for the height of the different uh, No, kneeling, standing, standing. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Some, some will have like little step stools to get above everybody. Yeah, you, some will bring their own little step stools to get above because they're not too sure exactly where they are. Um, but yeah, it does look like this wall of little bleachers there. And the photo bridge is right above where you see Channel 4, now it's Channel 5 shooting it down. It's like a photo bridge uh, right above. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just great when you see that progress, which you should. Um, this is now the, the traditions. I'm going to show you some of the statues. There's tons of statues and monuments about the Boston Marathon. Here and abroad, is Ireland has one, Canada. Um, Melrose has one, Clarence DeMar. I'm just going to focus on the ones on the course, um, even though this isn't actually the course, but this is close enough. Um, this is Pleasant Street in Ashland. As a crow flies, it's about a mile from the course. So it's right on the other side of the Amtrak, if it kind of gives you an idea where you are. The four kilometer mark that I showed you, that muddy photo, is like a mile that way in the tree. So if you ever want to visit here, this is really neat. Um, this is where the marathon started with that crosswalk in 1897, Pleasant Street. Uh, this is the end of the Sudbury River. There used to be a uh, mill here that made boxes for shoes, uh, burned down like in the 30s. So the first two years, 1897, 1898, uh, uh, that's where it started, about that crosswalk uh, for the first two years of the Boston Marathon. Um, then they built the BAA clubhouse, so they wanted to finish at the clubhouse instead of at that track. So the distance was a little different. So to accommodate that, they moved the starting line. There's a bridge right above, right to the right of that white building. There's a bridge that goes over the tracks, the Amtrak commuter rail. So for the next seven or eight years, it was there on that bridge. And then I think it reached like 80 runners one year, and they're like, oh my god, we've got to move this thing. So they moved it to the four kilometer mark. There was a farmland there, that muddy photo I showed you. And it was there for, for the third and final time in Ashland for about a dozen or so years until it moved to Hockington. Uh, but Ashland's trying to make this really, they really try to get the history. They've called it Marathon Park. They're doing it in phases of development. There's some great plaques. Uh, the first 27 years of the race was in Ashland at those three spots combined. So all the history, the Clarence de Mars and everything, it, it's uh, on these little plaques. There's a walkway here. They're really sprucing it up and making it nice. I think they're going to do a little museum next to it. Um, it's worth visiting. It's so easy to get to. There's a, a, um, a VFW hall right here. So if you Google Pleasant Street VFW, it gets you right there. But it's right here. It's, like I say, it's about a mile from the current course of four kilometer mark over here. So it's really worth just to be here um, where the marathon started, which is rare, especially something this old. Um, in Hawkington itself, there's a number of things in the town common. Uh, Route 135 is right there, the far road. Um, this is Marathon Way. It's a roadway between the common and uh, Route 135. For the race itself, this is closed where the staging is. If you see it on TV, it's a closed area. Um, this was, <laughs> I, I digress, but it's kind of funny, I just thought of it. This is also where Dave McGilvey was, was trapped in the port Did you ever hear that story? Dave McGilvey, the race director. This little triangle area is closed off to those officials, Dave McGilvery. He starts the races. So he, he used the Porter John here like five minutes before the race, and a state trooper noticed that the padlock was unlocked, so he locked it. And Dave's inside, screaming, but there's a thousand people, there's music, there's, no one could hear him. And he's trying to call, no one could hear He's in the Porter John like 10 feet from the starting line that he has to start in like four minutes. The world is watching him. Uh, it took a while for someone to find the key <laughs> to get him out. So now he says, if I use that, I put the lock in my pocket. I don't want that to happen. Um, that's, ask him about that sometime. He'll probably go, oh my god, no. Flashback. <laughs> so it was right in this little area. 
Um, this is George V. Brown. Uh, he's basically facing the start line extended uh, with a uh, pistol. Um, there's been a Brown family member, with the exception of a couple of years, who has started the Boston Marathon. The Brown family has been integral to the Boston Marathon, the BAA, the old Boston Arena, which predates the Garden, uh, the Celtics. They were, they've just been involved. This family has been involved in a lot of uh, things that are still around in the Boston area. Um, so they dedicated this really nice statue. He's facing, like I say, the starting line, George V. Brown with the starter's pistol um, right there. And they still have it. I think there's a granddaughter. Yeah, granddaughter, not great granddaughter. Uh, she's starting the past couple of years. So there's always been a Brown family member to continue that tradition, which is great. Uh, the BAA headquarters is right here on Ash Street. This is Ash Street, A-S-H. And right down about a block to the left of the common is this statue of the Hoyts, Rick and Dick Hoyt. Uh, yes, you can, right in front of the old school. Uh, the reason the statue is here is that they started behind the wheelchair athletes. So the wheelchair athletes would line up according to seeds, according to their speed, uh, on Ash Street. And then they would be escorted onto the starting line in that position, in that grid. And the Hoyts were right behind them. And the gun would go off and they would take off. So he spent a lot of his time here, so that's why, they, that's why the statue is here, not on the common, you know, one of the reasons. Um, they were really proud of this so much. I, I interviewed Rick a few times. Um, with Rick, you've got to send the questions ahead of time because you all know he can't verbally communicate, but he had a, a great dictionary on his, of words on his computer. And he would do it with his, with his chin or arm or something, and he would answer. And he was so proud of this. He, thought, he was just like, this is amazing. And I remember talking to Dick about this, the father. Uh, Rick just passed away, I think, last year, and Dick a couple years earlier. Um, the sculptor was in Texas, and they would FaceTime the progress of it. So Dick, once when they, they, show, they showed him his head, and he's looking at this on Facebook, uh, FaceTime, and he goes, that, that head is huge. You've got to change that. And the sculptor goes, no, it'll be fine, proportionally with the body. No, it's just, just look, it's huge. <laughs> And I was telling Dick, I said, you know, Dick, think about it. Unless you're looking at a statue of yourself, no one sees their face three-dimensionally. You just see it in a picture, on a mirror. No one sees what their real head looks like. And he goes, oh, yeah, he did say that. And it's, obviously it came out well. But it's just, he goes, it's so weird just seeing my disembodied head on FaceTime. You know, he's trying to go, I don't know, that looks good. Um, but, yes, yeah, it was a beautiful thing. They clean it up all the time. Um, it's amazing. Uh, the inspiration still uh, continues. There's, there's team Hoyts throughout the world. It's awesome that they have um, of, of what they started. This is Roberta Gibb, Bobby Gibb on the left. Um, she is uh, the first woman to finish Boston Marathon, 1966. She's from the area, and in the 60s, she was out in California getting her degree. Um, She's the smartest person in the room, if, if you ever get a chance to talk to her. She's a sculptor, a runner, has a law degree. She's a neuroscientist. She's a writer. You can talk to her about anything. She's awesome. Um, but you never know. She's so humble. So uh, she's out getting her degree in California. And she would run 20, 30 miles at a time. She loved nature. You know, child of the 60s, loved being tuned with nature. So she would just run. And she wanted to do the Boston Marathon. Um, prior to 1972, women weren't allowed to run in marathons. The Amateur Athletic Union, the AAU, which was the governing body of all races, Boston, Falmouth, New York, didn't allow women to run that distance. It wasn't the races themselves, it was the AAU, the governing body, um, didn't allow women. It was based on old Olympics, there was some women who kind of like passed out after finish line and had to breathe really heavy, and the old, you know, white guys are like, oh, okay, we can't do this. They can't, the women can't run this, you know, even though the guys are doing the same thing in the same event. So like, uh, women can't do this. This is un unladylike, can't do it. Uh, they can't run long distances. And that stuck for a while, unfortunately. She didn't know that. So she asked the BAA, 1964, she was going to run in 65, to run this. She didn't know there weren't the women's divisions. And the BAA correctly said the AAU doesn't allow women to run in the race. But then they said to her, women can't run that distance. Which Bobby goes, really? I just ran 25 miles Thursday. Okay, I guess I know what I'm doing on Patriots Day. Um, so at 65, she got injured. So in 66, she came up here. And at the time, like I showed you the finish line at the Prue, from 65 to 85, it uh, finished on Ring Road. Well, the start was on Hayden Row. 
actually. It wasn't on Main Street. So the runners for those 21 years had to start on a side street, run really fast, like 100 yards, and then go on Main Street. <laughs> uh, now we're just on Main Street. But that corner is where Bobby Gibbs stood. And she knew her pace. She was a good runner. So she waited until she saw guys running about her pace, and she would jump in. And she told me for the book, she goes, I didn't know if I was going to get arrested. Guys are going to push me off the course. I didn't know what was going to happen. So she wore these baggy Bermuda shorts, big sweatshirt, tied her hair back. But guys knew. Um, and she said throughout the whole race, no one had a problem. The guys were like, oh, I wish my wife ran. I wish my girlfriend ran. She goes, it was the best reception I ever got. Word spread. And by the time she finished, the mayor shook her hand. She goes, it, it was the best experience. It's exactly what I wanted to prove, 1966. Um, so to commemorate the anniversary, they wanted to have the statue in Hopkinton. Um, but to fast forward a little bit, in 1972, women were then allowed between the Title IX for equal federal funding for women and uh, men's, girls and boys sports, uh, and the AAU finally relented and said, okay, women, we can allow women to run that distance. That was 1972. So 1972, Boston's the first official one with women. But for those years, starting with Bobby in 1966, it was a fight, it was a battle. So to commemorate that, this was um, prior to COVID, so, I don't know, the COVID years sort of blend together, I can't remember. But prior to COVID, they wanted to get uh, a nice statue. So they asked Bobby, who was a sculptor. She actually created the first, second, third awards for the first women's Olympic marathon qualifier that Joan Bernard Samuelson won. It's a similar to this, it's like this tall of a woman runner. And the first, second, third place woman in the qualifying race in 1984 received that award. Um, and then they ran in the first Olympic marathon for women in 1984. Joan Bonite won it both, and she reveres that trophy. So they knew Bobby was a sculptor. So she was going to just do like a woman. And they said, no, no, we want you to do you <laughs> as the, the sculptor. She's like, I've never done a live model because nobody wants to stand in place and run as I'm you know, doing it. She goes, uh, all right, I'll try. So she's telling me as she's doing, you know, the model of it, she's like looking at her arm, you know, doing, looking at her hand, doing it. So she's looking, she, she's the model. <laughs> so she knew what she looked like with the Bermuda shorts and the hair back. And this is what she created. It's a beautiful statue. She really captures motion well with sculpture, which is difficult. Um, so with COVID, they couldn't dedicate it. Uh, between COVID and they were doing some construction. The town was near the town green in Hopkinton. They couldn't dedicate it there. So this, this is the dedication ceremony at the Hopkinton <coughs> Culture and Arts Center, which is down the other end of Hayden Row. Hayden Row is on Main Street, bisects the course, and it's on the other end near the school. So that's where they dedicated this. This is what this photo I took this from. And it's been in front of the uh, Cultural Arts Center since then. But I think this year, fingers crossed, I think the construction is done. So I hopefully think by this year, either by Boston or at least this calendar year, it will be in the corner of Hayden Row and uh, Main Street, is where the statue will be, where they wanted it to be. They wanted to wait till the construction was done. They didn't want it to tear it apart. Um, but that's what she created. It's a beautiful statue. She did a really, really awesome job. Um, and the one mile mark in Hopkinton is this statue um, at Western Nurseries, where they, they uh, supply trees and shrubbery. It's a nice little brick plaza here. This is probably, I don't know, 20 feet from the road. You can see this. The runners run by it. It's right off 135, the one mile mark. Um, beautiful statue called The Spare of the Marathon uh, by Tewksbury artist. Um, it's, this is Styrianos Kyriakidis, who you saw in the black and white photo winning in 1946, the Greek, running on the ground of Greece, uh, the, the rough edges of Marathon Greece, Athens, Greece. Uh, right here is the god Pan, P A N, who supposedly helped Pheidippides deliver the message after the Athenians beat the Persians. Went back to Athens, rejoice, we won. Um, but then we need more soldiers because the Persians are now going to attack us from the water. You know, that kind of, so that's Pan. On the other side of this is his face with the wreath around it. It's a beautiful statue, real tall. Uh, it's a long story of this. There's another one identical to this in Greece. Dimitri Kyriakidis, Stylianos' son, wanted this statue for the 2004 Athens Olympics. So the Olympics were returning to Greece in 04. So we thought it'd be great to have this in Marathon at the start. Contacted the Marathon mayor. Yep, we'll do that. Uh, then the mayor changed. The new mayor said no. So then Dimitri went to the finish in Athens. That mayor said, okay, 
But we also want a statue of Sperdon Louis, the Greek who won the 1896 Olympic marathon. So Miko Coffin, who created this uh, Tewksbury, probably is thinking, you know, it's not a painting. I can just paint a guy. It's the sculpture I've been working on. Let me think about this. So what he did was he created a separate body of Sperdon Louis, the Greek who won the 1896 first uh, Olympic marathon. And he sort of stuck it <laughs> to Kyriakides. But whereas Kyriakides is actually running on the ground, Sperdon Louis isn't. He's sort of suspended. So the theme sort of that Miko created is that Kyriakides is running with the spirit of Spiridon Louis, hence the spirit of the marathon title of the statue. So there is one of these in Athens. It, it, ju it just arrived. It had problems with customs. I think like a, a week and a half, two weeks before the Olympics, they finally released some customs and installed it. It's still there. You can Google it. And then a couple of years later is this one in Hockington, the identical statue. Beautiful. It's really very tall. Um, uh, amazing detail. It's, it's a lovely statue. This is old Johnny, old Johnny Kelly. This is at a 19.1 mile mark in Newton. Um, city, to give you an idea, uh, Commonwealth Avenue is in front, Walnut Street kind of like right behind. Newton City Hall is at mile 19, kind of give you an idea of the area. Um, Young at Heart, the old Frank Sinatra song that Johnny sang. Um, if you asked him anywhere, he'd sing it. <laughs> he loved that song. Uh, the idea, there was this gentleman in Texas who had this idea in a dream of a statue of Johnny Kelly in his 30s holding hands with himself in the 90s just because he ran so long. Uh, There's a lot of honors for Johnny Kelly that they wanted to wait until he stopped running, but he never stopped running. <laughs> Runner's World wanted to name him Runner of the Century. They wanted to wait till the century. He just kept running. So these honors started to pop up while he was still running. He, he ran until the day he died at the age of 97. So they dedicated this statue, if you know the area a little bit, it originally was dedicated but a, a block this way, if you're running the course, a block this way up the course. There's a little area, island there. Um, and the statue was facing the runners. And it was dedicated Marathon Weekend in 1991, the Sunday, the day before the Boston Marathon. It was, it was great, Bill Rogers, Johnny was there, the creator of, of this, the, the artist. Um, Ibrahim Hussein, who was a defending Boston champion, was there, which if you know anything, even for the amateur athletes, but the elite athletes especially, they don't do anything the day before the marathon. They rest at the hotel. But he's so revered that the defending champion came to this ceremony. It, 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 that's just how honored he was. Um, so it was a great ceremony. Five or six months later, uh, true to Boston drivers, a car swerved and hit it and broke its arm. <laughs> Um, so they repaired the arm, but then they're thinking, you know, we don't want body parts in the garage every time a car hits it. Let's move it. <laughs> so they moved it here. Again, it's about a block or two uh, this way. About 80 feet in from the course, and he's now facing the direction of the runners. Instead of facing the runners, he's facing the direction of the runners going up the hill toward BC. Um, it's kind of tough to see during the marathon as you're running. I think there's a sausage vehicle in the middle selling. You can't really see it. Uh, but it's a great place for training. Everyone comes here. This is like their place. They'll put the bottles here. It's a great um, place to, to get together for your training group. Uh, it, it's right there. You can see it at the set of lights. Um, it's a little darker. Now, I took this picture years ago. The, the, these bushes are a little higher, um, obviously, um, and there's more foliage in the background. Um, but it's a, it's a great statue right where it is. I remember the son of the um, um, people who put this down uh, what they did is they had a bunch of bags of ice here. And when on a crane, they lowered it on the bags of ice, and they had the amount of time the ice would crush to move it. And then once the ice, that's where it was. Um, so underneath here is plastic ice. And the, the son told me he was young. He put $10 underneath here because he remembers hearing like those old ships have coins on the mast of the ships for good luck. So he goes, if you ever see the statue on its side, I need my 10 bucks back. <laughs> so there's 10 bucks on the here somewhere. So it's a beautiful statue. Again, it's at 19.1 mile, about a mile before Heartbreak Hill, which is a direct connection to uh, Johnny. People wonder why it's not there, but at about 20 and a half miles right before BC, it'd be tough to see it. I mean, there's, there's Carriage Road, and there's the, the island of grass, and then Calm Ave. They just have to place it somewhere. It was easier here. Um, for that story, in 1935, Johnny won Boston. So he was favored in 1936. 
Um, so around this area, um, ahead of him was Ellis and Tarzan Brown out of Rhode Island, one of our great marathoners. And around this area, 19 miles or so, Johnny was behind Ellison. Um, so it took him a little while until about 20 and a half miles before BC to catch up to, to Ellison. And then Johnny sort of tapped him on the back, kind of like, you know, this is my race now, which sort of woke up Ellison and Ellison took off and won. And Johnny came in fifth place uh, that year. And Jerry Nason, the sports editor of the Globe, who covered the sport uh, racing for decades, said that move broke Johnny's heart and it morphed into Heartbreak Hill, uh, which is right before Boston College. Um, I've known, I had known Johnny for decades. I remember asking him, he came in, like I say, he came in, he won in 1945, so he won twice. Um, he's finished it 58 times, started 61, came in second place seven times, and he always says, half those I should have won, those second place. And he goes, I should have won in 1936. I said, no, nah, fifth place is good. He goes, no, nah, that's a stupid thing. I was a cocky young kid, I should have, when you catch up to someone, you don't do that. You just keep going past them. You don't wake them up. I said, I think you did okay. You're an Olympian, you won twice, you know, like those stick with you, you know, kind of thing. But it's a beautiful statue. It's still, obviously still there. Uh, this is Boylston Street itself. Uh, this finish line is right about here, through these spires here. Uh, here's the Lennox. Um, this is Pablo Eduardo's Boston Marathon um, marker, he's called. It basically is the memorial marker of the bombings. There's two of these. Um, this one in front of the old Forum restaurant that the second bomb was detonated. And there's a similar one about a blog in front of the Marathon Sports. Um, he really tried to get feedback from the families, the survivors. There's a lot of committees involved. Uh, he tried to really incorporate everything. He has different granite and stone from throughout New England as an example of coming together. Um, he wanted this to be a beacon like the city was. So that's why he had this. I took this sort of like a sunset to kind of, it, it's much brighter at night, but I wanted to kind of give you an idea what it looks like during the day and when the lights start to come out. It's one of those pieces of art that's like very simple at first glance, but then when you're in it, you know, you can walk around it, kind of engulfs you, really, really touches you. Um, he also did things which I didn't even think of. Um, he took two parking spaces and extended the sidewalk out as a representation of the permanence of the bombs affecting us. He wanted to kind of take the parking spaces away of the permanence of the monument, which I thought was a kind of a unique, subtle thing that may not be, you may not pick up. Um, so it, again, it's here and in front of the Marathon Sports. Um, it, it's really unique. I mean, he put a lot of effort into that one. It took a little while too. They kind of missed the deadline. Um, but he, he wanted to really make sure he got it right. Um, and I'll end on this one. This is about two blocks after the finish line. Um, Boylston Street is right up there. This is the Boston Marathon Centennial Memorial or Monument at Copley Square. Uh, the Fairmont Copley Hotel is right on this side. The public library is here, kind of give you an idea where you are. Um, that's Boylston Street. This is probably two blocks from, maybe two and a half from the finish line. So as the runners cross the finish line, they keep going. They get their mile hour blanket, water, metal, they, they walk right past this. Um, the original idea, I saw the blueprints, this is supposed to have an archway, but that was shot down. So the information and stuff that was on the archway is on these four uh, marble posts. Um, each post has um, the BAA logo, the town seal that the course goes through, and then one has uh, male runners, one has female runners, Wheelchair runners, all different areas of the race are represented on these posts, really beautifully done. Um, the different colored granite is from throughout New England. The elevation right here is the first top. The middle is the logo. <laughs> this is the course itself through the communities. So those different colors uh, represent each town. So it can differentiate between uh, each one. Uh, the wreath is represented right here. Go right around the medallion. Um, and this gray area here, which, which you can see closer in some of the photos, but not this one, um, starting in the middle and just going all the way around to the farther edge is uh, the name, country, year, and time of every male winner, female winner, male wheelchair winner, f female wheelchair winner, and male and female masters winner. So they're literally etched in stone. They do it every year, they engrave it, they update it. Um, at some point, they're going to have to 
expand it, so maybe that's why they have the brick here. Um, but e th these are rows. It just goes all the way around in order from, from right in the middle all the way around. Um, I had a friend of mine from Canada who won the Masters in 08 or 09. She didn't know about this, so I showed her. And she's getting all teary-eyed because she revered the race like most people do. I go, you are, you're literally etched in stone. She's like, oh my God. This is like, she just, it was almost better than winning um, for her. But this, it's really, it's tough to see because it's flat and there's some tents around here during Marathon Weekend. I took this during Marathon Weekend. You can tell the Fan Fest was there. Um, but with this angle, I'm standing on like a fourth or fifth step of, you know, if you ever come here on that weekend, there's those big trucks and um, command center vehicles. I'm on the steps. So normally you can't get this elevated photo. So I'm kind of glad uh, it was there. Um, but it's, it's well worth seeing the detail and they polish it every couple of years because, you know, you walk on it. But this is Copley Square. This is the whole area. Um, and down here is a, a little bit beyond is the tortoise and the hare. To kind of get your, your bearings of the, of the area. Um, so, yeah, it's really worth seeing. Again, there's a lot more in different countries. Johnny Hayes, um, is, there's, there's one in Ireland, like I said. Clarence DeMar is one in Melrose, which I do feature in the, the photo book. It has a 200 photos. But just for this one, I focus on the ones just on the course that you can see as you're running or want to visit. Um, so, if anyone has any questions on anything I brought up or didn't bring up, anything Boston related, I've written enough about it, so I don't mind if it's something about running it or watching it on TV or anything like that. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. When was the first televised uh, race? Uh, the first, actually, that's interesting. I did a story about that. It used to be GBH had a delayed Catherine Switzer, who had run in the late 60s. She would say, this is the early 70s, they had little snippets like most things, but they had like a concerted effort to make some coverage. She would be in the studio. And they would have different people along the course filming segments of it on big tapes. And they'd throw the tape over the crowd to a courier on a bicycle who would bicycle to the GBH in Brighton, plug it in, and they would narrate it and air it like a half hour later. And then have, then recap it at the end. But as far as like live to live, that was the mid-80s where they would have uh, channel four, five, and seven. Everyone did it and they had their own people doing commentating. Now there is like a commitment. It past 20 or something years, it was Channel 4 only, wire to wire. Now it's Channel 5 that has it for whatever contract that they have. Anyone can cover it, but the wire to wire coverage in the old days was those TV wars. Now it's just whatever that one station is. <coughs> so yeah, imagine that in the old days, these big things throwing it over the crowd. <laughs> they start small like that, right? <laughs> Any questions? Yep. Yeah, why, why did Hancock uh, stop uh, sponsoring the race? Um, it was like the 38, they did about 38 years, which is really good for that. They stopped with the Red Sox. I think they were just reorganizing. Manual Life bought them years ago. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, because even after Manual Life bought them, they continued it. Um, if you remember at Fenway Park, above the center field scoreboard was John Hancock. They took that down. So it wasn't just a marathon. I think they were trying to just redo their their efforts somewhere. Nothing against, I mean, 38 years for, a, for a, a main sponsor is unprecedented. I really can't think. So Bank of America, it's funny with Bank of America, uh, like I said, the finish line's a couple blocks before this. I was joking, because I know, I know a lot of people at the BAA. I remember joking, I said, you know, in 86, you had to move it from in front of the Prudential Center to closer to the Hancock Tower. I said, now with Bank of America, there's a Bank of America like three blocks down. Are you going to move the finish line three blocks down? I'm just joking. He goes, ah, no, it's, it's staying with it. Because <laughs> there is. There's a Bank of America. <laughs> I said, no, keep moving it down. You know, be in Charlestown after a while. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, it's almost 40. I really can't think of something that long. Yeah. Is, is it Johnny Hancock now um, owned by We New Life from <coughs> of Canada? Yeah, they bought them. Uh, almost maybe 10, 15 years ago by now, I think, or merged them or whatever. But they continue doing that sponsorship. I just think they wanted to do, I don't know where they are sponsoring now, but I think the Red Sox, like the Fenway Park signage is gone in the marathon, just putting it somewhere else. Again, it wasn't anything bad. It's just whenever that, that extension ex uh, expired, I think a year or two ahead, they, to give BA a heads up, they said, look, we're not going to renew um, 
just to give you a heads up, look, look elsewhere in Bank of America. Bank of America sponsors Chicago marathons, so it was a good fit. They're used to doing something with marathons. Yep. Uh, you didn't mention Mike Dukakis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I he ran, uh, I, I actually saw him run. Uh, yeah. Oh, you did see it, yeah? Well, it was interesting for, for the wreath. I did a story about the wreaths. And I interviewed Governor Dukakis. He's, he's like 90 something now. He still teaches at Northeastern. Um, he did run in high school and did like three and a half hours. He's from Brookline. And his connection, I mean, he remembers, uh, he, for the book, he was telling me he remembers Kiriaki just running. And as a kid, he's watching that in 1946, you know, on, on a Saturday. And the, he goes, Us Greek kids were torn. Here's a Greek, but then we love Johnny Kelly. We don't know who to root for you know, as a kid. And then in high school, he ran. Um, and he, he was telling me that Kitty Dukakis, his future wife uh, and current, uh, gave, said that she gave him water. Whenever I ran on Beacon Street, uh, mile 24, I think it is, and he entered Brookline, I always think of the story. He goes, yeah, Kitty said that she gave me water. I said, well, that's pretty neat. Do you remember that? He goes, I don't, I don't remember that. He goes, but if Kitty tells me she gave me water, she gave me water. <laughs> He goes, smart marriage. I said, that's good. So then when he became governor, um, one of the honors of the governor and the mayor is presenting the wreath. So that was not lost on him. Obviously, he knew, because you remember how proud he, the presidential campaign, he always said, proud Greek American. I mean, he was really proud of that. Um, so that stayed with him, too. So he's, he's connected throughout. Like that photo I showed you of the, the Great Hall and the State House, I pointed out Governor Dukakis with Kitty. They were in the front row. Um, he remembers vividly these stories. He told me a great story about this, I'll digress a little bit, about Kyriakides. He said during the war in, in uh, Greece and other areas, he said the Nazis would round up some of the men middle of the day on a Sunday, kill them as a statement for people who would walk by. And they, they went up to Kyriakides as just a random guy. He said, empty your pockets. And Kyriakides ran in the 1936 Olympics, which was in Berlin. So one of, his, one of the things in his pockets was his ID from the Olympics, which has a swastika on it. And the soldiers saw that and go, oh, go ahead. It was that close, yeah. And Kyriakides, and Kyriakides ran Boston in the 30s, didn't do well, because he was very lightweight, and he just wasn't healthy because of the war. But in 46, when he came back, uh, George Demi, they weren't going to allow him to run, because in the old days, you get a physical, you know, everyone remembers Jock Simple at uh, one of the race officials for the BAA. He'd look at you and go, yeah, you can't run. You don't look good enough. Um, but Demeter sponsored Kiri Kitas, put him up in his hotel. Demeter owned the hotel, fed him, got him ready. So he ended up winning in 46. Uh, great friends with Johnny Kelly, too. But uh, yeah, so that connection with Dukakis is just, there's so many points on a timeline. And I remember interviewing him, I go, tell me all these different things. So from a kid, seeing him to presenting the wreath. I mean, come on, that's like the gamut. Being a Greek, that, that just has to be, you know, amazing for someone like that to, to live through that. I mean, that, that's, a, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So in, in the years when there weren't many runners, you know, going back to the 20s, 1930s, were, did it still bring out a lot of spectators? Do people really like Yeah, because it was the only thing. Back then, there was only a few marathons. There was one in Yonkers, Culver City, Boston. They basically were used for qualifiers for the Olympics, so people were still interested. And there weren't that many little dirt roads. But you, I remember Dukakis was saying, he goes, there's no TV. You need to have a transistor radio. Or even before that, you'd wait to see like, a vehicle coming. <laughs> and then that's how you would know. He goes, but yeah, we still would come out because you know, we'd look in the paper, and they'd have everyone's name, and we'd check off. You know, I've done some talks at uh, senior residences, and people and they would be telling me, yeah, we'd have a newspaper, and they'd be the list of the 100 runners, with the, and they had big bib numbers back then, if you see the old photos, and we'd check them off as kids, look at, sitting on the curb. It'd be a great day for us. Um, also back then, it was on Patriot's Day, which was April 19th. So prior to the late 60s, now it's the third Monday in April, permanently. But prior to the late 60s, whatever day of the week, April 19th, was, was the marathon. If that was a Thursday, a Friday, a Saturday, that's the marathon. Unless it was a Sunday, then they'd have it Saturday or Monday. So it'd be a break in the week. <laughs> you just go out there and watch it on the dirt roads and everything. Yeah, yeah. And they'd see all these great runners that they'd see in the Olympics or read about, you know, these famous, you know, 
be really exciting as a kid seeing that. And everyone loved Johnny Kelly, obviously, for decades just to cheer him on, the local guy. Anything else? Well, I'll be here. Oh, yeah, Ken. Uh, funny story. Uh, you mentioned uh, Mike Brown in high school. Well, I went to Newton High, and of course, the marathon came right near the high school. Yeah. And uh, we had a, a guy who uh, uh, decided to run, and if he made uh, the finish line, he got five bucks from everybody. You know? And he made the turn uh, onto Commonwealth Avenue from uh, Route 16, and uh, somebody gave him an orange. <laughs> and he stopped and he sucked on the orange for a minute. Then he threw up. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, never try anything new. Yeah, even back then, never try anything new. <laughs> so, Paul, thank, thank you. you. Very much. Thank you. I'll be here. Yeah, think of anything stories. Take a look at the books. Yeah, and I just want to mention our next event is on April 25th. It's the Boston, the Boston Saxophone Quartet. Plays a whole range of different music, so please join us for that. And last, I just want to thank Nick and Waffle Cable TV who, who were filming it tonight. So, again, thank you, thank Paul. You. For thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks.